Hey Optimancers, Chris here. In February I did a review of the Soul Knife Rogue in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. I said overall I thought it was a pretty good subclass. A lot of my viewers agreed, though some pointed out some problems they saw with the subclass. Cold Fusion said, It should be noted that this subclass gets hard countered by Mind Blank, which every caster at higher levels will have precast. Similarly, constructs will ruin your day, and statues coming alive to wreck your face seems to be quite common in the adventurer's lifestyle. Now, I'll agree that constructs are something that happen in campaigns. I wouldn't agree, though, that every high-level caster uses their only 8th level slot on Mind Blank. I would actually say that's quite rare. Either way, I should note that the Psychic Blades use Dexterity, which means once we get a good magic weapon or two, we're probably just as well to use that. And if we have any magic weapon at all, as long as it's finesse or a ranged weapon, we should be just fine against any of those challenges. And if we don't have that magic weapon, then we're in no worse shape than any other rogue. But it's important to remember that just because you became a soul knife doesn't mean you give up being a rogue. You can still use weapons just like any rogue can. What Soul Blades does for us is that we have a pretty reliable weapon to use, even if we don't find a magic weapon. And at early levels, using Soul Blades offers significantly higher damage than a rogue using two-weapon fighting, since we're adding our dexterity modifier to the damage of the second attack. Now, as we go up in levels, this becomes smaller and smaller as a percentage of our total damage. So yes, if you get a really good magic weapon, it is probably better. Remember though, magic items get distributed amongst party members. Your lower reliance on getting a magical weapon actually helps the whole party. Having a backup magic weapon in reserve though, this is a good idea once it's available. And by the levels this is likely to be the case, the damage difference isn't going to be a major factor. Quintal says, I hate Psychic Blades wording so much, because they only work on the attack action. You can't use it on opportunity attacks and other off-turn attacks, which is like the best way to optimize Rogue. And it isn't even a balance issue, because you could go around it by having a dagger in your hand. Unfortunately, you'll need to drop it anytime you're taking an attack action and getting it back up afterwards with a free object interaction. This will work by raw, but my mental image of this cringes me so much it actually physically hurts. Now I will agree that if you're making a melee rogue, Soul Knife wouldn't be my first choice. However, if you are making a ranged rogue, then you aren't going to be making opportunity attacks or other off-turn attacks very often, if at all. I mean, if you want to hold a dagger because your ranged rogue might someday make an opportunity attack, I mean, I guess you can do that. I just wouldn't count on it coming up. As for it being the best way to optimize Rogue, I'll talk about that in a bit. Raceland says, I've started playing a Soul Knife recently. To be honest, I'm having a difficult time optimizing even with a 20 dex at level 5. Where do I go from here? Full Rogue? Bard Multiclass? Couple of full caster levels? Hey Raceland, I don't know how much further you've gotten into your campaign, but I should note that after punching the math, I can tell you that if you do go straight Soul Knife, level 5 is the hardest level. Because other damage dealers, you know, they just got their extra attack. And you got one more D6. That said, it only gets better from level 5, even if you go straight classed. That said, nothing wrong with going caster with a multi-class. Rogue's multi-class just fine. Today I'm going to show what happens if you continue straight Rogue. Then Peter Rasmussen says, I don't get why everyone is so hyped on the Psionic Rogue. If you want to use the Psy Blades, you have no attacks with your reaction, at least not unless you stow and draw weapons at the same time. You can't use Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade, and you can't use Magic Weapons. Also, a bonus action attack is not that great on a Rogue, as they have a lot to use their bonus action for already. Even with the accuracy boost, this looks to me like it will do very poor damage compared to a rogue that has Booming Blade and any way to make reaction attacks. So, there's a lot to go through there, though I've already talked about reaction attacks. 
Booming Blade and Green Flame Blade once again apply to melee rogues. As for the magic weapon thing, I mean I have to agree. If you want the benefit of a magic weapon, and you get a great magic weapon, then that may indeed be the better choice than the side blades. Though nothing's preventing you from using that magic weapon. The side blades are a feature. They don't necessarily have to be the only thing your character can do. We don't have to give up on weapons because we became a soul knife. We just now have a feature that means we have another option. And when that option is better, we should use it. As for the bonus action attack, I don't disagree. In fact, my calculations show that if the Soul Knife uses steady aim with their bonus action instead of attacking twice, the difference in damage is actually marginal. That said, it's still lower and you can't move. So given the choice, I mean, I'll keep my movement and do a bit more damage. And this brings us to the big one. What is the difference in damage between a melee rogue that's using reactions for attacks, using booming blade and green flame blade, and a rogue attacking at range like our soul knife likely will? And honestly, it is significant. If the focus is on offense rather than balancing it with defense, a melee rogue is the way to go, and I've done builds on that. And psychic blades isn't, at least after level 5. At lower levels, the Soul Knife will actually outdamage most rogues in melee as well, but as feats and scaling booming blade damage come into play, that doesn't last. So why would we even play a ranged rogue? And just how bad is the damage? Well, the main reason I would play a ranged rogue is defense. Rogues don't have good armor class, they don't have great hit points, and if you're using your reaction for attacks, then you aren't using uncanny dodge when you get hit. There's also a disadvantage tactically for melee rogues as well. Because if you want to be attacking with sneak attack, and you absolutely do, and pretty much any DPR or damage per round calculation I've ever seen assumes you're going to be sneak attacking every round. Because if you're playing a rogue, you should be able to sneak attack every round. And there's a few different ways to do that. You could be using steady aim, you could be attacking uh, an enemy when an ally is next to them, or you could be attacking from hidden. But with melee, you have a lot less options because steady aim requires you don't move, and you're generally not going to be hidden and attacking in melee, which means you're relying on having somebody next to your enemy. So that means you have to choose those opponents based on who has an ally next to them. And that is still totally doable. But what it means is sometimes you end up choosing your opponents based on that rather than picking the opponent that is the right choice tactically for the battle. This doesn't impact your damage output, but it can impact the effect you have on the relative success of a battle. Your impact on a battle isn't just based on how much damage you inflicted, but also who you inflicted it to and when. Finally, Let's remember that an unconscious rogue does zero damage. We are way better off as a party if enemies are attacking high armor class, high hit point melee characters rather than the party rogue. Putting your rogue up into melee with booming blade and working as many of your reactions as possible into attacks will increase your damage output as long as you're conscious. But there is a downside to doing that. So the question is, is it worth playing at range. We know we get benefits from it, but how much do we give up? And when it comes to the damage of a ranged soul knife, honestly, it starts out amazing. And then around level five, it's fine. And then it becomes solid again as we continue to level up. We also gain some flexibility in our build options, which aren't as shoehorned into race or feed options as other builds are which is a definite upside. So we're going to do a soul knife build from levels 1 through 20, and I'll go through the numbers and how much damage we can expect at all points of our career. If you would like to support the content of this channel, please check the link in the video description for my Patreon. Patrons of this channel see these videos early and non-monetized, and my top-level patrons can join me to play some D&D each month. Today I would like to recognize these top-level patrons. James Thomas, John Matera, John Cripps, Jonathan Haynes, 
Joseph Robideau, Joseph Van Horn, Joshua Samuel Lappel, Justin Bennington, Kurt G., and IGW. Thank you all so much for your support. Let's get started. So here's our character. We're going to name him Rob, Rob Barry. We don't need any setting specific content for this character. And actually, we don't even need the customize your origin for this character as well. If you're playing in a campaign where the DM doesn't allow that, this might be a good choice for you. That said, depending on the race you want to play, you may want to have customize your origin. I have the optional class features turned on. With rogues, there's just one optional class feature and that's steady aim. And what steady aim does for us is as a bonus action, we can give ourselves advantage on our next attack roll on the current turn. So you do your bonus action first, then you attack. You can use this bonus action only if you haven't moved during this turn, and after you use the bonus action, your speed is zero until the end of the current turn. And this basically means you can't move at all during your turn. So most of the time, if I don't need steady aim to do my sneak attack, that's the better option. But if there is a particular enemy I want to attack, and I wouldn't get sneak attack against them, then I am better off doing the steady aim and attacking once, even if it means I don't move. And I'll talk a little bit about what the difference is in damage as we get into those numbers. Now I get a bit of a treat here because halfling is my favorite race. This is not a secret. And halfling works perfectly well with a soul knife build. So I'm going to make a stout halfling for Rob Berry. Here's what we get as a stout halfling. Probably my favorite racial feature in the game is Lucky, which all halflings get. Whenever we roll a 1 on a d20 for an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can re-roll the die and must use the new roll. So you roll a 1 on an initiative check, an attack roll, a saving throw, any ability check, you get to re-roll it. This means that halflings are just a little bit better at pretty much everything. Now, Mechanically, the difference here is pretty minor, but it affects just about everything. And when you're playing and you roll the one, it feels lousy. But when you're playing and you roll a one and you're playing a halfling, it actually kind of feels good because you get to take advantage of this great feature. Second thing we're going to get is brave. This again is every halfling. How often do you make saving throws against being frightened? Well, reasonably often. So this will come up. Then we get Halfling Nimbleness. This allows us to move through the space of any creature that is of a size larger than ours. Again, this is all Halflings. So Halflings are that one race that can move through an enemy's square. I don't expect that to come up a lot with this particular build, but it may once in a while. Now what we get as a Stout Halfling is we get Stout Resilience. We have advantage on saving throws against poison, and we have resistance against poison damage. How often does poison come up in the game? Pretty often. How often does poison come up in the game when you're the character that is often scouting ahead or checking for traps? Really often. Poison resistance and advantage on saving throws against being poisoned, gonna be fantastic. Other things to know about a stout halfling, plus two to dexterity, that's perfect. Plus one to constitution, perfect. And our base movement speed is 25, which is not perfect. That is one of the disadvantages of playing a halfling. For arranging our ability scores, what I'm going to suggest is we're going to dump our strength and charisma. We're going to maximize our dexterity by putting a 15, it's going to make it a 17. Our constitution, we're going to put a 14, that's going to make it a 15. Then we're going to go with intelligence of 14 and a wisdom of 12. And you could very easily switch around the intelligence and wisdom to something else. I find that as a rogue, I'm often making investigation checks. They're based on intelligence, so I like to have a good intelligence. And wisdom, of course, affects perception and saving throws. But if you want to throw it all into intelligence or all into wisdom, you could do that. You could even live with not having a great intelligence and wisdom if you wanted to be particularly charismatic or strong. The main factors here are the dexterity and the constitution. For our background, our character began as a charlatan. That's going to give us proficiency in deception and sleight of hand. Very useful skills 
for a rogue to have. And we get tool proficiencies in the disguise kit and the forgery kit. Again, ones we might want to have as a rogue. And remember, we will be getting thieves tools automatically from being a rogue. So at rogue level one, we are going to get four skill proficiencies. That's more than any other class. And I'm going to recommend perception, stealth, acrobatics, and investigation. All these skills are skills we can expect our rogue to do. Perception, to notice danger and ambushes, stealth, of course, as a rogue is kind of iconic. Acrobatics for balancing. And investigation is often the skill we use to look for things like traps or secret doors or hidden things. We'll gain expertise in two of the skills that we're proficient in. Expertise allows you to double your proficiency bonus at level one. That's a plus two bonus, though eventually it's a plus six bonus in that skill. So characters with expertise end up being much better in the skills they're experts in than other characters. I'm going to recommend stealth and perception. This is going to make us very good at stealth at first level and reasonably good at perception because we start with a lower wisdom score than our dexterity score. It won't be as high as our stealth, but because we're adding expertise, it's going to be as good as any of our skills that we're not experts in. As a rogue, we are absolutely reliant on sneak attack in combat. Sneak attack allows us to do extra damage when we attack. And what happens is, is as we increase in levels, sneak attack becomes a bigger and bigger percentage of our total damage. At high levels, sneak attack is most of our damage. And how do we get sneak attack? Well, we get it either by attacking with advantage or attacking an enemy that has an ally within five feet of it. You never get sneak attack if you have disadvantage. Sneak attack is something we should be looking to apply every turn that we make the attack action. So if we have an even choice between enemies and one of them has an ally within five feet, that should be the enemy we attack. If we don't have an ally within five feet, we need to find a way to get advantage. There's two main ways to do that, either attacking from hidden or using our steady aim to get advantage on the attack. Steady aim is not in play yet though. So at this level, we're relying on allies being within five feet or having a chance to hide before combat, which I wouldn't expect to happen. And finally, we get Thieves Cant. That's kind of the code for rogues that they use to communicate with each other. Depending on your DM, this may come up a lot. This may not come up at all. With our starting equipment, it's worth noting that we begin with Thieves Tools and leather armor. We're also going to get a melee weapon and a rapier is going to be better for us than a short sword. Short swords can be okay for rogues if we're attacking with two weapon fighting, but if you are a ranged rogue, you can't draw both short swords with your interact with an object unless you have the dual wielder feet, which is not worth the investment. So for us, a rapier is a better choice and we'll use a ranged weapon normally. And if we get caught in melee, we can drop it and draw a rapier. And we can begin with a short bow and a quiver of 20 arrows. That'll be our ranged weapon, though ideally it won't. What you're going to find is, talk to your other party members, most classes get a light crossbow, and a lot of classes can't really use it very well because they are a strength-based build, or they're relying on a cantrip or something like that. You even have some characters that start with multiple crossbows. Talk to your artificer. They very likely have two light crossbows. And I would definitely grab a light crossbow from somebody over the short bow because then you're going to do a D8 damage over the D6 damage. Just a little bit better. Though, if you can't get the light crossbow, short bow will do. I recommend the Burglar's Pack just because other party members are going to have the Explorer's Pack or the Dungeoneer's Pack. Burglar's Pack gives us a couple things that maybe nobody else has. Some other things we're going to want to do with our equipment as we get a little bit of money. We're going to want to get studded leather armor instead of leather armor. It's just plus one armor class and there's no downside. We're also going to want to get our disguise kit and our forgery kit. We're proficient in them, so we might as well have them. So at level one, our damage, if we are using a light crossbow, is going to end up being about 7.33 damage per round versus the baseline I use, which is a Warlock with Eldritch Blast and picking up Agonizing Blast when they can, and that would be 5.68. So we're 29% over the baseline 
and this is before any subclass. One thing you'll notice on the math is I'm using a 63% chance to hit instead of a 60% chance to hit, and that's because with a halfling, we're re-rolling ones, so normally I'd use a 60% chance to hit, but if we can re-roll a one, it increases our chance to hit to 63%. Doesn't make a huge amount of difference. For the most part, it's about one point of DPR, but it's a little boost. Now, the reason we want to be a ranged character, well, look at our armor class. This is a 15, that's including studded leather. It's actually going to be a 14 when we start at level one. 10 hit points. If this character goes into melee, there is a good chance they'll go down. If they go down, they do zero damage. I talked about the problems with DPR in a previous video, and this is a perfect example. So we'll level up to level three, and this is when we pick up the Soul Knife subclass. One thing to note is every time we reach an odd level, our sneak attack goes up by a die. So we've gone from 1d6 to 2d6. And we're going to get a few different things here. At second level, we get cutting action. This allows us to do the dash, disengage, or hide action as a bonus action on our turn. Our bonus action is largely going to be used up. We might be attacking with our second psychic blade. There's a chance we might be using steady aim if we need to pick a particular enemy to attack. But there are times when cunning action can absolutely come up. Let's say you get caught in melee. Is it worth using a bonus action to disengage and give up that second attack? I would say so. As an alternative to steady aim, you can use your cunning action to hide and then make your attack with advantage from hidden. And that might allow you a little bit of movement in addition. Steady aim might come up more often. This comes up at level three, and this is where we use our bonus action and we can attack with advantage. Gives us a lot more flexibility in applying our sneak attack damage. And as a ranged character, we will be okay not being able to move most of the time. The archetype we pick, naturally, Soul Knife. Then we get our psionic power. This is a pretty big deal, one of the main reasons we're taking Soul Knife. We get psionic energy dice, each of which is a D6. And we have a number of these dice equal to twice our proficiency bonus. So at level three, that means we have four dice. So how do we use these dice? Well, the first is the Psy Bolstered Knack. If we fail an ability check using a skill or a tool for which we have proficiency, you can roll one psionic energy die and add the number to the check. So that means every time we roll stealth, every time we roll investigation, every time we roll perception, any time we fail, if we fail by six or less, we can roll a psionic energy die and potentially turn that failure into a success. And we want to do it every time that that ability check is within six of being a success. And the reason we want to do that is because if it doesn't turn it into a success, it's free. The only time it's expanded is if it turns the failure into success. So that's actually going to make it hard to use all these dice through your side bolstered knack. The other thing we're going to get is psychic whispers. This allows us to set up telepathy with a number of creatures equal to our proficiency bonus. And then we roll our psionic energy die and that many hours we can speak telepathically with those creatures. And this is two way communication and you can be up to a mile distance from each other. So this is actually a pretty good ability for a rogue to have because rogues are often sneaking somewhere. And if they're sneaking somewhere, number one, they want to have silent communication with other members of the party. And number two, they're not always beside other members of their party to talk anyway. So this keeps that communication available. And the first time we use this power, it's free. We don't even spend a psionic energy die unless we want to use it again. And remember, this lasts for hours. I wouldn't count on needing it more than once. So what we end up with is Psychic Whispers is basically free. And Psy Bolster Knack, it's only going to spend dice when it turns a failure into a success. And how often is that going to happen a day? If it happens four times or less, then you're never going to be in a situation where you needed a die and you didn't have one anymore. So spend them. Spend them whenever you can. This is one of those features where it is technically a resource, but it's really hard to use up that resource. So use it. And then this character will be better at skills than any other rogue. And then we get our Psychic Blades. And whenever we take the attack action, we can manifest the Psychic Blades from our free hand, and we make the attack with the blade. It's a finesse weapon, and it has a thrown property. And you can throw it up to 60 feet. 
which is why we are a ranged rogue. Because the damage is going to be the same, whether we attack in melee or ranged, so let's attack at range. If we hit, it's a d6 plus our dexterity in psychic damage. And after we attack, we can do a bonus action attack with a second psychic blade that does a d4 plus our dexterity damage. Now the advantage of this is, in order to apply sneak attack, we have to hit at least once. We can only apply it once on our turn, but we have to hit at least once. So if the first attack misses, that second attack gives us another chance to apply sneak attack in addition to the d4 plus dexterity. And for a ranged rogue to get a second attack on their turn with a bonus action, that's not easy to do. They would need something like the crossbow expert feat, but in this case we don't need a feat. Psychic Blades is going to give us that bonus action attack every turn. And at level 3, I think we're way better off using Psychic Blades than any weapon that we're likely to have at that level. But generally in these builds, I don't assume any magic weapons. So at level 3, I assume we're attacking with our Psychic Blades. And we end up with a total damage per round of 14.23 versus 7.65 baseline. That's an 86% increase over baseline. Now I will say this is uniquely good. We're not gonna stay at 86% and we're certainly not gonna get back to 86% again. But if you are playing a third level character and you wanna do a lot of damage, Soul Knife works. It will also do really nice damage compared to baseline at level four. It's level five when things change. And that's always the way it is with a rogue. Rogues simply don't get the scaling the same as other classes. Other classes tend to do similar damage between levels 1 and 4. Then level 5 comes and they get a big boost. Then they don't do a whole bunch more damage until they get to level 11. Then they get another significant boost. And then potentially another significant boost at 17. And if they're a fighter, not till 20 because fighters get kind of screwed. But with a rogue it is a more gradual progression because we're getting that sneak attack every other level and that is the primary source of our damage as we level up. So what we find is those levels right before level 5, level 11, level 17 is when we tend to look the best and at those exact levels is when we tend to look the worst. So looking at level 5 now, at level 4 we're going to get ability score improvement and I am going to recommend the skill expert feat. This is normally just a reasonably good feat. It allows you to increase an ability score, so it's what we call a half feat. And it gives us an additional skill proficiency and an additional expertise. Because of the Psy Bolster Knack and because of Reliable Talent, which is a feature that rogues get later, rogues really benefit from having more skill proficiencies. So this is a way to do that. It also is a way to apply expertise to one additional skill and investigation, as I said, is going to come up a lot. So I think it's really worth getting expertise in investigation. And athletics is a good skill for us to have proficiency in, because that's things like climbing and jumping. And climbing especially can come up for rogues. And our strength isn't good, but once we add proficiency and we add Psy Bolster Knack, we're not going to be bad. And once we add reliable talent, we're actually going to be reasonably good at it, despite the fact that our strength isn't good. And of course, increasing our dexterity brings it to 18, so plus 4 bonus. Then at 5th level we get two things. First, our sneak attack goes up by 1d6, and second we get uncanny dodge. This is going to be the use of our reaction. Starting at 5th level, when an attacker we can see hits us with an attack, we can use our reaction to have the damage against us. Ideally this won't come up every round, but when it does, it allows you to take a little bit less damage, and it makes up a bit for the fact that we don't have as good an armor class. Now one thing I did note is that while we're using our Psychic Blades, we're doing Psychic Damage. That means we can't take a feat like the Piercer feat that I might have taken at level 4 if I had been a different kind of rogue. And how much damage the Piercer feat actually adds is really difficult to calculate actually. But I'll tell you that what I came up with is at this level it would have been about 1 point of damage per round and at 20th level about two points of damage around. It just never gets over that amount. And damage is the only thing the Piercer Feet does for you other than the plus one ability score boost. So although I still think it's a decent investment for a rogue, I definitely don't think it's a huge loss. For us, at level five, 
we're doing about 18.91 damage per round versus a baseline of 16.5. That's only 15% above baseline. That's it. 15% above baseline. That's not bad damage. That's okay damage. So we're still doing okay damage. Now, if we use steady aim instead of using our bonus action attack, then our actual damage ends up being 16.88, which is still above baseline. I mean, barely above baseline, but it's above baseline. And I'll say that that is the worst it ever is. And I'll also note that the difference between steady aim and doing the bonus action attack isn't that much. We're talking about two points of damage total. And the reason why it's not as big as you might think it would be is because actually we're going to do a little bit more damage with sneak attack on average with steady aim. And the reason for that is because normally if we're attacking once with our action and once with our bonus action, well, if we hit with our action, we're applying sneak attack. And then if we hit with our bonus action and it turns out to be a critical, then it's too late. We can't apply our sneak attack anymore. But if we are attacking once with advantage, then if either of those D20s is a 20, we get the critical and we apply our sneak attack damage. So the damage that kind of comes into play with critical hits and sneak attack actually is doubled. Even though it's a small percentage of the total damage, that portion of it is doubled when we do our calculations. And that's why the difference between steady aim and attacking with our bonus action isn't that much. But all things being even, we're better off doing our bonus action attack because it does deliver more damage. And when we look at our skills here, we can see we have a lot of skill proficiencies. We have a lot of expertise. We've got some great numbers here. But remember that Cybolster Knack, we can count on that to be adding to all of it. And at this level, our Cybolster Knack has gone from a D6 to a D8. So we're adding a D8 anytime we fail a check. So if we fail a skill check or a tool proficiency check, by eight or less, we always want to use our side bolster knack at this point. And I would imagine things like investigation, perception, or stealth, we should never fail on those checks. I mean, just consider our worst case scenario. Perception, that's our lowest skill with expertise. We got a plus seven. What happens if we roll a one? Well, we're going to re-roll it because we're a halfling. But what happens if we roll a two, which I call the halfling one? Well, we're sitting at a base 9. Now we're going to add a D8. We're still probably looking at a 13 or 14, even when we rolled a terrible result. I mean, if we end up with a 15 on our stealth roll, we rolled terribly. And that's already higher than the passive perception of most things you're going to come across. So moving on to 7th level. Of course, our sneak attack goes up by 1 at 7th level. At 6th level, we're going to get expertise in 2 more skills. I'm recommending here Athletics and Deception. Deception is the one I was a little iffy on. Athletics, I think, is a no-brainer because Athletics, like I said, comes up on a number of things that rogues do, but rogues generally don't have a good strength, so they're usually not that good at Athletics. But if you take expertise in Athletics, that makes up for that. We, of course, have Cybolster Knack on top of that, so we're actually going to be really good at Athletics. And like I said, Deception could have gone a number of ways here, but again, Deception is something we're basing off an ability score that's not very good. By taking Expertise in it, again with Cybolster Knack on top, we can pretty much guarantee we're going to make our Deception checks as well, despite the fact we're basing it off a low ability score. At 7th level, we get Evasion. This allows us, every time we're going to make a Dexterity check that would give us half damage on a success, instead we take no damage on a success, half damage on a failure. This is just another way that rogues can kind of make up for the fact that they have a little less hit points than some other classes and a lower armor class than other classes. So in a lot of ways, rogues can take more damage than other classes. Evasion is one of the ways to mitigate that. I should mention that evasion only works with dexterity checks. So if you're in something like a white dragon's breath weapon or a cone of gold or something like that, if you're making a constitution saving throw, you don't apply evasion. As I'm sure you remember, at level 5, our damage struggled a bit. It was still okay, but not great. At level 7, we make some recovery, and now we're at 21.86 versus a 16.5 baseline. So we have jumped from 15% over baseline to 32% over baseline. 
Nothing wrong with 32% over baseline. That's not insane damage. We can make a rogue that does more than 32% over baseline, but not a rogue that is likely to stay up in a combat. This one is far more likely to do so. And as we can see here, our athletics and deception, they're both at plus five. Now, considering we have a plus three proficiency bonus, this would be like a character having that proficiency if they had a 14 in the base ability score. So not bad at all. There might be members of the party that have better athletics and deception, but not really because we have side bolstered knack on top of that. And that's adding like four on average. So we're really looking at more like plus nine or plus 10. So we're probably as good at athletics as like the barbarian is. And no, I'm not suggesting we go and grapple anything with a rogue. So we're looking at level nine now. Of course at level nine, just like all the other times, our sneak attack goes up by D6. We're also gonna get an ability score improvement at level eight. And honestly, at this point, I just get my dexterity up to 20. It's gonna improve my initiative. It's gonna improve my armor class. It's gonna improve my to hit roll. It's gonna improve my damage. Then at level nine, we're gonna get our soul blades improvement. So we get two things here, homing strikes and psychic teleportation. Homing strikes, if you make an attack roll with your psychic blades and miss the target, you can roll one psionic energy die and add the number roll to the attack roll. If this causes the attack to hit, you expend the psionic energy die. So once again, there is no risk to doing this, even if you missed by a lot. The only way the psionic energy die is expended is if it turns a miss into a hit. I'll also point out we now have eight psionic energy dice and they're d8s. How many are we spending on Cybolster Knack? I mean, if we spend it on all our failed skill checks, the number that get turned into successes, I would say at best four. And I would imagine most of the time less than that. Now in my Soul Knife video, I said, you might as well throw it on every time you miss. But given a little more thought, what I'd say is, if you attack the first time and you miss, definitely use the psionic energy die. Try to get that sneak attack. But if I have hit with my first attack and already applied sneak attack damage, then it really depends. If I figure that I'm going to have lots of combats, I might want to save those psionic energy dice. If I don't think I'm going to have lots of combats, then I mean, I might as well spend them. There's no point finishing the day with psionic energy dice left over. So... Yeah, if you're only having one or two combats a day, I would use them on every attack. If I'm having lots of combats a day, then I might only use them if it's a chance to apply sneak attack damage. And when I did my damage calculations for this level and future levels, I assumed we're only adding it if sneak attack is at stake. Then we get psychic teleportation. This is a teleport, and the way it works is it's a bonus action, uses our psionic energy die, we roll our psionic energy die, and we can throw our psychic blade up to 10 feet times the result to an unoccupied space we can see, and that's where we teleport to. Now, I'm not a huge fan of this as far as teleports go, because the range is random, uh, so we don't know how far we're going to be able to move, but I'm a fan of teleports, and we don't have any other teleports, so this is our first one, and it's a bonus action, so it's still pretty good to have. At level nine, we're now adding homing strikes. And the way I figured that out is I took my chance of missing twice, which is 14%, and our chance of changing a miss into a hit, which I calculated about 56%. And multiplying those together by the damage of the adjusted attack. And it ends up not being a whole lot. About two points of damage per round average at this level. Still, that puts us to 28.31 against a baseline of 17.7. .7. That's 60% above the baseline. So we are actually delivering really good damage at this level. But once again, this is that case where with rogues, we do really well before level 5, 11, and 17. This is before level 11. So let's look at level 11. Uh, first off, of course, an additional D6 on our sneak attack. Our Psychic Energy die has gone from a D8 now to a D10. Just to be clear, that's an additional D10 on any skill check that we fail. Or an additional D10 on an attack that missed to turn it into a hit. 
We're also going to get an ability score improvement at 10th level, and I'm recommending the feat Resilient Constitution. Shore up those defenses. We are not proficient in constitution saving throws. This is going to give us proficiency, and it's going to increase our constitution to a 16. This is also going to improve our hit points. And at level 11, we're going to get reliable talent. So this is almost ludicrous now. Whenever we make an ability check that lets us add our proficiency bonus, we can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as 10. Let's just discuss how insane that is. So of all the skills we're proficient in, the worst we have is a plus 7. That would be on athletics or deception. So any roll below 10 is treated as a 10. So that means 17. And then we throw Cybolster Knack on top of that, which is a d10 on average 5. That means we roll our Halfling 1, which is a 2, becomes a 10. Now we have a 17 athletics. Then we roll a d10 and add that. And despite rolling a 2, we're still likely going to roll over 20 in the end on our worst skill we're proficient in. We likely cannot fail a stealth check, sleight of hand check, perception check, investigation check, deception check, athletics check, or acrobatics check. We will never be grappled against our will. We will never get ambushed. We will never miss the trap. We will never fail to pick the lock. We will never fail to pick that pocket. Basically, 100% for anything we're proficient in, which is pretty much anything you'd expect a rogue to be able to do. I should mention this includes the disguise kit and the forgery kit as well. So anytime we make a disguise, we're going to be undetectable. Anytime we do a forgery, it's going to be a perfect forgery. So what about damage? How big a hit do we have? Well, we are doing now 31.76 against a 27.15 baseline. So we have dropped to 17% over baseline. Still, that is okay damage. It's actually a little bit better than compared to 5th level, but it is still not a huge amount of damage. Again, we have that waiver. 11th level is a low point, and then we pick it back up again. If we want to increase that a little bit, we could use our homing strikes on every attack that missed, and it will go up a little bit. So let's look at Rogue level 13. At 12th level, we're going to get an ability score improvement, and here we can actually have a bit of fun. If there is a feat you really wanted to try out but never could fit it on a build, this is the build you can fit it on. You can do it right here. My guilty pleasure here is the mobile feat, and I think it's a pretty good feat for this build. With a speed increase of 10 feet, now our halfling has a base speed of 35 feet. So we're just a little bit faster than the rest of the members of the party, and I kind of like that. If we take the dash action, difficult terrain doesn't cost us extra movement on that turn. And this one I like as well. When you make a melee attack against a creature, you don't provoke opportunity attacks from that creature for the rest of the turn, whether you hit it or not. So the reason why this one is actually useful is because if we do get stuck in melee, as I mentioned before, we could use our cunning action to do the disengage action, and we would still have our action left to make an attack. The problem is, is that the attack is not going to have advantage, nor will we have our bonus action attack. Our damage isn't going to be quite as good because our chance of hitting at least once is not as good. In this case, we can simply make two melee attacks, so we have our full chance to hit. Damage is the same for us, melee or ranged. So it really makes no difference at all. The only reason we don't do melee attacks is because we don't want to be in melee. Of course, if we get stuck in melee, then the reason we want to make melee attacks is because we don't want to be in melee. We make those attacks, we move away. Then at 13th level, we get Psychic Veil. This allows us to become invisible as an action, and it lasts for an hour. We don't need to concentrate on it. Like with most invisibility, it ends early if we deal damage to a creature, or we force a creature to make a saving throw. And once we do this, we can't do it again until we finish a long rest, unless we spend a psionic energy die to do so. Guess what? We got psionic energy dice, so we can do this as much as we want. We're probably not going to use it a whole bunch of times in a day. I will say that if sneaking is an option, we will automatically succeed on the sneak check, so there's no point in doing Psychic Veil. But invisibility does have benefits that sneaking doesn't do. If something is looking at you, you cannot hide but you can turn invisible. Also, if you ever need to sneak through an area where you will be in plain sight, 
you will not be able to sneak through that area unless you're invisible. So Psychic Veil does do some stuff for us. In terms of combat, we could use it if we have extra psionic energy dice to just turn invisible like in between every combat. So then on the first turn of combat, our first attack is with advantage automatically and any attacks against us before our turn comes up are with disadvantage. I'm not sure I would use up my psionic energy dice that way because that really does use them up. But it is an option. Damage at 13th level, as we would expect, it's going to start improving against the baseline. We're up to 35.23 versus a 27.15 baseline. That's 30% up. Let's go. We know it's going to get better. Level 15, we're going to get Blind Sense at 14th level. This makes us aware of the location of any hidden or invisible creature within 10 feet of us. This is pretty circumstantial. This is not blind sight, so it does not mean we can attack invisible creatures without disadvantage. We just know they're there. Now, technically speaking, you kind of know they're there anyway, within the rules. The way this might come into effect is if they're also hidden. Like I said, pretty circumstantial. 15th level, though, love this ability. We gain proficiency in wisdom saving throws. You know what that means? It means we are proficient in dexterity saving throws, in wisdom saving throws, and constitution saving throws. We're also proficient in intelligence saving throws if it should it ever come up. So we have really good saving throws. If you watch this channel, you know I like to have good saves. I should also mention since our proficiency bonus is now plus five, we now have 10 psionic energy dice. And yeah, look at those saves. Not proficient in strength or charisma, proficient in everything else. You know how often strength and charisma saving throws come up? Not very often. In addition, we have advantage against being frightened, we have advantage against poison, and we re-roll all our ones on saving throws. How's the damage doing at level 15? Well, we're up to 38.68 versus a 27.15 baseline. We're up 42% again. Not shabby at all. So level 17. Once again, we get a d6. Once again, we're in one of those areas where the damage of other classes has scaled more than ours. At level 16, we're going to get an ability score improvement, and I'm going to go ahead and take Lucky. You knew it was going to come on here at some point. And one thing I'll note here is Lucky works really well with a character whose saving throws actually are good. And that's a bit counterintuitive. You would think you would need it more if your saving throws aren't good. And you might need it more. It just It's one of those cases where it's less effective. Because let's say you've got, say, a plus one wisdom save. You get hit with, like, a hold person spell or a dominate person spell. And the save DC is a 20. So you're going to make your roll, and you need a 19 or a 20 to succeed. So you're probably going to fail. You got lucky. If you use lucky, you're probably going to fail again. But if you're us and you're looking at like a plus seven saving throw, you still probably will fail on the first check. But the chance that we fail the check twice in a row is only about 30%, meaning good chance we'll succeed with the lucky feat. And then we get red in mind. This is one of the features that Soul Knife gets that doesn't excite me as much just because it is very limited. But basically, we use our Psychic Blades to deliver Sneak Attack. We can have a creature make a Wisdom Saving Throw, or they are stunned, though they do get a Saving Throw every turn. And that's a reasonably good effect. The problem is, is that once we use this feature, we can't do so again until we finish a Long Rest, or we have to spend three Psionic Energy Dice. And that's just a lot to spend on a feature that may or may not work. So I wouldn't be doing it more than once per long rest unless it was like a really high stakes battle. Because three psionic energy dice. Remember, these are the resources that are guaranteeing that we're going to succeed on every skill check we make and turning a lot of our misses into hits that are going to allow us to apply sneak attack. If we give up too many of those psionic energy dice, we're going to have to give up one of those things. And that's a big cost. Speaking of psionic energy dice, they're now a d12. So when we miss and we apply a psionic energy die, we're probably going to hit. And in terms of skills, it really doesn't matter. We've gone so far up in terms of our minimum amount we're going to ever get on a skill check. I mean, sometimes DMs will scale results based on how much you succeed by. So in those cases, it could make an effect. 
though we can't use the psionic energy die unless we fail the check in the first place. So how's our damage at level 17? Well, it's 42.15 versus a 35.4 baseline. So that's 19% above baseline. So it has gone down, but I'll note that at 5th level, it went down to 15%. At 11th level, it went down to 17%. And at 17th level, down to 19%. So each time we hit one of those milestones, it was a little bit less painful than the time before. So now we're going to jump to level 19. Our sneak attack is now as high as it's ever going to get at 10d6. At 18th level, we get elusive. That means that no attack against us can ever have advantage. And at 19th level, we're going to get an ability score improvement. And I'm going to take another little guilty pleasure here with Bountiful Luck. This is a feat I've never had, but I've always wanted to have it. As a halfling, you can take Bountiful Luck, and it allows you to use your reaction to basically give your luck feature to another party member. So if an ally within 30 feet of us rolls a 1 on a d20 for an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, we can use our reaction and let the ally re-roll the die. There is a chance I will have to use Uncanny Dodge, and if I do, Bountiful Luck won't be available, or vice versa. But other than that, I would expect to have it most of the time. And when we use this ability, we can't use our lucky racial trait before the end of our next turn. So hopefully we don't roll any ones on our next turn. But this is, again, just something I've always kind of wanted, because I've always liked the idea of a halfling as a good luck charm. And in this case, you literally are. But again, we're wide open here. You want to take the tough feet? You go ahead. You've always wanted to take the charger feet? Go ahead. Have some fun with it. Level 19, our total damage is 45.6 versus a 35.4 baseline. And that's a 29%. And that is where we're going to finish, because at level 20, these numbers don't change. Now, I just want to mention 45.6. If we were to use steady aim instead of attacking twice, the damage would be 44.88 on average. That's less than one blow. So if you want to use your bonus action on steady aim, the damage cost there really is insignificant. The main thing is the non-movement. But if we're picking enemies, it may be well worth it. So where does our percentage versus baseline end up in terms of our entire career? Well, it ends up at 35.9% above baseline as an average. And that's good damage. It's not the highest damage we can get with a rogue, for sure, at least with DPR numbers. And I've mentioned the problem with DPR numbers in a previous video, because again, a dead rogue does zero damage, and we are assuming things here. But as far as just the straight numbers and math go, the damage of a ranged rogue using Soul Knife, not bad at all. 35.9% over baseline is decent damage. And we're getting all the automatic skill successes, good saving throws, uncanny dodge, and the various reasons why we might want to play a rogue. We also have flexibility. We don't have to play a halfling. We could play whatever we want. We can take some different feats here and still achieve decent numbers. But just to be completionist, level 20 rogue, all we get is stroke of luck. Stroke of luck kind of sucks. If your attack misses a target within range, almost never going to happen. You can turn the miss into a hit. Alternatively, if you fail an ability check, you can treat the d20 roll as a 20. And once we use this feature, we can't use it again until we finish a short or long rest. Well, we're going to have a hard time using this feature because we can pretty much turn any miss into a hit. We can definitely turn any ability check where we had proficiency into a success. The only time I see this coming up is if we're doing the ability check and it's something we're not proficient in and we fail. Then maybe. This isn't a very good feature. So if you wanted to multi-class out of 20, go ahead. But I mean, it doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Nothing is going to be game changing as a one level dip at level 20. But yeah, the capstone for rogues kind of sucks. And it sucks especially for the soul knife. But that's Rob Berry. And that's just a straight rogue soul knife at range. And our average damage is between 30 and 40% over baseline through 20 levels. It peaks right before 5th, 11th, and 17th level. And it dips right at those levels. But on average, over 35%. And it never dips below 15% over baseline. 
and there is improved flexibility. There's improved defense. Our saving throws are great. Our skills are great. We can never fail. We have the telepathy. We have the teleportations. Personally, I like spells. But if I'm going to play an on spellcaster, this is something I would consider. So if you want to see the completed character sheet, there is a link in the video description down below. Otherwise, until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.